And so getting into Romans and, and looking at, and we'll, we'll get into this really deeply in chapters like 6 and 8 and 12. But one of the things that we want to keep in mind as we go into Romans is, is Paul's compounding phraseology as he builds sentences and statements. Paul can pack more into a sentence than most men or women could in a, in a paragraph. I mean, whenever you read the way that he builds and he assembles clauses, and I'm not familiar with, the, the, uh, with, with Greek or, or, or Hebrew text, but I can only imagine um, what it might have looked like in his or, original writing. But we're going to hit um, a few of those here in chapter 1, and so I'll make sure to take note of that, but it's, it's just so rich in meaning. Whenever you look at the phrases that, that Paul builds and, and the statements that he makes, he just layers one important fact onto another important fact. And more often than not, it's, it's settled around Christ. And that makes it you know, incredibly meaningful. And also, as this book is written to the Christians in Rome, you had a, a pretty substantial Jewish population, but you also had a lot of Gentiles. And those two populations were extremely culturally different, and the, their, the, histo the history of their beliefs and their belief systems were also very different. So there would have been a lot of culture clashes as they tried to worship together and as they tried to work out what this new religion was and who this man Jesus was to them. And Paul just does an excellent job in cutting through all the noise and bringing it down to brass tacks and saying, this is why we're here. This is what it's all about. This is how you should live. This is how you should, how, how you should behave with one another and how you should behave to non-believers. So I know that <clears throat> Romans is a book that we all at least have at least some passing familiarity with, but it's also one of those books that the deeper you get into it, the richer you understand it to be. And so um, it's one of the most important uh, books in the New Testament. It's an epistle, which means letter. And Paul's letter to the group of Christians in Rome, it has a lot of principles of the Christian faith, and it persuaded those men and women at that time, and, and it also persuades us. At the time of Paul writing this letter, he had not yet been to Rome. Okay, So he was writing to a place that he was yet to visit. It's estimated <clears throat> that the book was written in the autumn of 57 AD. I'll give you an idea of the timeline there. But the guidance and the theological content of the letter suggests that Roman Christians would benefit from both the general and the specific tenets of Christianity that Paul elaborates on. And we get deeper into the chapter near the end. Chapters 14 and 15 suggest that Romans also would benefit from le lessons in living harmoniously, which I mentioned already. Um, but just like today... Right, The gospel of Jesus Christ brings us all together. We, we probably would meet in some capacity, maybe through happenstance, but because of Jesus, we all know each other and, you know, in some cases have really deep and strong relationships. Just like we have here at Eastland, we see the same thing at this church in Rome, and that's where we get a lot of the directives from Paul on, on how to live properly. Um, the subjugation to one another in love is something that Paul compels that would have helped these early Christians and also helps us. Would have helped them in that huge city of Rome uh, with, with the ab abundance of different beliefs and, and sin all around. But however great the impact was on the Christians in Rome that received the letter, the impact on the whole of the world since then is much, much greater. Right? Think about the thousands of years Roman, Christians have been reading Romans, been reading about walking in the Spirit, not walking in the flesh, and just having their faith and their spirits enriched by these, these words um, that, that the Spirit uh, inspired Paul to write. Um, so a sermon and a greeting is kind of what I've titled this first lesson. And whenever you read those first few verses, it really is just his greeting. You can read through those and you can understand that he, as I mentioned earlier, he just layers on clause after clause, building the meaning. It's so, it's so rich and it's so accessible, the way he describes it. And this feat, the way that he wrote that, it's pretty common for Paul. And we'll revisit that as the book wears on. But these first six verses, he orders a sequence that calls attention to Paul's own apostleship. And it also specifies the divinity of Jesus. And it explains in short order how God, 
the Holy Spirit, and Jesus created an environment that provides grace for all of sinful man. So I've asked Dan Meredith to read the first six verses of uh, Romans 1. Dan, if you don't mind. Thank you, Dan. Um, do we have, in, that, in those six verses, is there any information about the gospel in that passage, in those first six verses? Anybody picking up anything? Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. You've got the reference to the prophetic words. Um, from, from what the Jews would have recognized. And it is a gospel that Paul recognizes has come to fruition and that has also been called upon uh, beforehand by the prophets, which exemplifies its divinity. And then in verse 5, um, Paul mentions obedience through faith. See the exact phrasing there. Through him we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among all nations for his name. So we think about obedience and faith being naturally connected. How are obedience and faith connected? Yeah. I agree with you, Steve. It's... If it's truly faith, then obedience will naturally follow. If faith is in, if the thing that you're having faith in asks you to do something or, or compels you to act in a certain way, the faith is a little bit more suspect if it doesn't compel obedience. And so Paul is making that distinction and he's making these sort of expectations and challenges very early on in the book. So if you think about the first order of business uh, Paul gets down to is his gratitude and some of his desire. The saints in Rome most likely had returned back to Rome after the events of the resurrection and the outpouring of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost. Their faith was widely known throughout the world. Um, we won't read it, but verses 7 through 15 show us how deeply Paul cares for the Christians in Rome. And although he hasn't yet visited them, he intends to so that he can shore up their faith with preaching and with instruction as he did with so many other churches around the world, around that, um, that part of the world at that time. But Paul's prayer for the Romans is that he can come to them as he considers it his responsibility to educate them on the gospel of Jesus Christ. Paul's commitment to the truth and to having faithful believers properly understand the nature of God and Jesus is obvious in his messaging. And Paul's faith and his dedication to his purpose that God has called him to is inspiring, right? Because he, he, he's not trying to just do the bare minimum. You know, he sees what they need and he can't help but express his gratitude for them and express his desire to come so that he can help them. It's interesting the amount of emotional intelligence that Paul has. I think he understands how spiritually mature he was. And he also understands the need for some of that instruction or that experience to be laid upon some of these growing folks in this church in Rome. And his desire to want to do that um, is a great example for us to follow, to look for those opportunities. Okay. The just, the just shall live by faith. Okay, this is a common, I guess you could say, Christian saying. You know, we, we pull it right out of the Bible. You hear it, you see it. I've seen it on t-shirts. But as much as Paul stands on and believes in the gospel, he confirms to them that he is not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. So it's, it's not just something that he keeps to himself and that he is confident in, but he wants to share it, right? 
this statement suggests that some people had reason to be ashamed of the gospel. Just like today, right? If you're ashamed of your faith. Likely that was due, though, at that time to the political and cultural events surrounding the, the death of Jesus. Even though it had been many years, there's still a stigma there um, for this, this religion, this new faith. And many Romans would have thought it was too fantastical or ridiculous. Many Jews would have continued the belief that it was sacrilegious. And other pagan worshipers might have thought that this new Christian ideology was, was foolish. But Paul is taking a stand, right? And he's leading by example saying, I'm not ashamed. And if you are ashamed, look at me. I have no reason to be ashamed. And so despite this environment that I just described about the Jews, the Gentiles, the citizens of Rome, Paul just sets this example by speaking out strongly. Um, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. So this quote, the just shall live by faith, is, is from Habakkuk, uh, chapter 2 and verse 4, where it says in kind, Behold the proud, his soul is not upright in him but the just shall live by his faith. Okay, so if we, if we kind of go with Paul into his frame of mind and think, okay, he's, he's kind of showing his, his Jewish heritage a little bit by quoting this obscure um, Old Testament minor prophet. And then he's, this, this phrase in Habakkuk 2.4, it says, look at the proud, his soul is not upright in him. Right, So, the, the, the proud man, even though he's proud of himself, his soul is not in the right place because he's not standing on God, right? He's, he's relying on himself. That makes his soul not upright. But Paul says, but then, the, but then that Habakkuk 2.4 says, but the just shall live by his faith. And the meaning there being not by himself. And so when we think about that phrase, the just shall live by faith, and we think about this context that Paul is saying, don't be ashamed of the gospel. Is there a different dimension of meaning that Paul is trying to convey by saying the just shall live by faith to this particular audience in Rome? That question's about 30 words long, so I, I don't, I'm not surprised nobody's jumping at it. But if the Old Testament Minor prophet Habakkuk can make a statement of that sort and talk about the just living by faith. Paul is saying to them, do not be ashamed by your faith. On the contrary, live by it. Let it be a guide. Let it be a director for you and your steps. So the contrast of pride and living by faith is an interesting choice for Paul to give to the Romans. Um, but Paul is giving them a model of a life having lived by faith, and that should give them confidence in Christ. Okay. So now we'll look at the target of the wrath of God. So although we're just getting started in Romans, um, we're already pretty deep into some theological ideas. Not, not too deep, maybe about knee deep. Um, but verses 18 and 30 through 32 present a powerhouse of clarity on the gospel and how to live as a believer. So if you're not there, look at Romans 1, 18 through 23, um, I've asked Jeff to read that, if you don't mind, sir. Thank you for reading that. Um, and, and there is a lot of information packed in there. Um, and that's not really 
gospel-based information. This is more, you could think of it as, even though it's coming out of the Bible, it seems a little bit secular because Paul is talking about people that, um, that dispel the, the, the notion that there's knowledge of God's presence in, in the world. And so um, whenever we think about this passage here, it's telling us a couple things. It tells us that, number one, ungodly and unrighteous men are targets of the wrath of God. So what does verse 18 say that they do? It says, verse 18 says, who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Okay, so the truth exists before these men were, were born, before they came to be. The truth exists after they were born or they came to be. The truth exists independent of whether I believe or you believe or they believe or not. But these men see the truth, and what do they do? They, they suppress it. And because of that suppression of the truth, and this is not God's truth or my truth or your truth. This is truth, the truth of of. God's love, the truth of the gospel, the truth of his presence, the truth as he is our creator. Suppressing that knowledge creates them as targets of God's wrath. So from verses 18 through 23, Paul explains how God's existence is plain in his creation. Um, like Jeff read, even his eternal power and Godhead. So he's explaining to the Roman Christians that even people that have not heard from others about God they still have knowledge of God. So what are some ways of how people not knowing the Bible or not having talked to someone who has knowledge of the Bible, how can they know God? Does anybody have any idea of an example there? What is Paul talking about? Observe the creation. That's the, it's like Occam's razor. It's the, the simplest and most likely explanation. It's, it's difficult to look at the order of, you could pick any plant or any simple animal and not observe the idea of an intelligent creator behind that. You can go on and on about the solar system and the rising and setting of the sun, and, but just in the design of everything, it's suppressing the truth not to admit that we're living in a place that was created by an intelligent being. But the reason that people do not submit to God is due to their own foolish notions. So, as we're reading here in Romans 1, they exchange obedience and their obligation to glorify God for their own faulty wisdom. And back to the, the, the pride and, and standing on our faith um, idea there. But instead of um, glorifying God... Instead, they will exchange for a belief in the corruptible creation of God. So Paul's primary point here is that it is obvious to discern that this world was created by an all-powerful creator, but people selfishly pursue their own desires instead of properly glorifying God. And also, and I don't, I mean, this was a little bit of an aha for me when I started this study. Instead of glorifying God, what do they glorify? They glorify his creation. That's really evident in these idolatrous old societies that we read about, right? And even in India, like when I've seen there, they, they glorify like animals or they'll glorify like the sun or they'll glorify some aspect of, of the world. They'll glorify God's creation. I think today this kind of thing still happens, but it is a bit evolved, right? So there's a, there's a, lot, more, there's a lot of pride and a lot of relying on ourselves, but then... Instead of glorifying God, people glorify other things in the world, and they have continued to glorify the things that he created, but they also glorify things that they create, right? So you can think about like music or technology or, or, any, or money or anything. It could be literally anything, but it's the same ideas as before, right? Instead of, what, of, instead of obeying and, and loving and, and giving God his due, we obey and love and give due to the things that he created, the things that are in the world. The same kind of idea. Um, okay. Can you think of any other examples of people worshiping the created over the creator? Any other examples? I mean, I took a stab at it. Yes. Yes.
Right. Um, I, I think you make a really good point, and I think that um, to some folks, whenever they understand some aspects of how God's creation works, it's, it's not really seeking to control, but you feel like they're a little bit closer to being able to control and understand. And, and it, it is more of like, okay, I get the do, I get the reward, or look how amazing humans are. They would have been able to figure out how this works rather than the obvious conclusion, which is how on earth was this, that, how, this is inconceivable that something as, as amazing as, as insects' head that swivels or the way the wings work or the way that they, they pollinate flowers, no human mind could conceive of these things. And instead of making that conclusion, we make the conclusion of, okay, well, let's just worship the science part of it or this or that. And I'm not taking away from any disciplines or anything, but I think you make a good point. Anybody else? Yes. Yeah, that's, uh, thanks for bringing that up because whenever we talk about how amazing it is, look how this robin works or look how this animal works, if we put those in the right context, the right priority, those are indeed elemental when we consider the spiritual aspect of God and the heavens and how he created and what our purpose is to glorify him, to love each other, to be good to each other. And it's, it's just the idea, again, of putting the emphasis on the wrong thing, worshiping the wrong thing. So, yeah, thanks for that. That's relevant. Okay, anybody else? All right. Yes. Yeah, yeah, you're right. That's that's the foundation of the whole thing, right? And there's a lot of I'll be honest, like when I read Romans 1 and I I understand and I don't question the fact that some maybe tribe in the Amazon or off some island off Australia somewhere never, never has held a Bible or had anyone talk to them about Christ. But they, looking out and seeing the way the world works, the way their relationships work, they can recognize that, that, that there is a creator. And then also kind of think about how in the patriarchal age, before God handed down uh, the Ten Commandments, there was still a modicum of worship from those folks, too, that's referenced. There's some sacrifices that are referenced there before they're commanded. So there is some inkling. I can't really grasp it, I guess, just from being raised in the church and not having been around it. But then understanding that we, it starts somewhere, right? It starts with that belief that I live in a place that was created by something much, much greater than I, and that has a plan for me. From there, knowledge and, to a very large degree, providence follows to help to spread the God, to help to spread the gospel and to, to get that knowledge into the hearts of willing men and women. Thank you all for those comments. You can keep them coming. Um, all right. Looking at the creator um, over the creature. Okay. So because people have substituted God's creation for God. Now we're getting to the consequences. Okay. Because people have substituted God's creation for God, God leaves the people to dwell in their sin. And in fact, he allows that sin to spiral into yet more deplorable conditions. So how many of you guys are familiar with this concept? Um, probably pretty familiar to at least some of you. And it's, it's this idea of, of God building in, at least in my mind, building in the consequence to certain behaviors and allowing them to happen when he sees that there's an unwilling heart that's not willing to, to recognize him and, and to make things right with him. And so um, the sin of homosexuality is called out in particular here. And make no mistake, this isn't Paul's opinion, nor is it presented as an, a viable alternative lifestyle. 
But homosexuality among men and women not only is sin, but serves as a punishment uh, for those that have dwelled long without honoring their creator. So it's interesting when we look at homosexuality in our modern context and how it's lifted up and, and, and valued, um, when we look at it biblically, it's actually a punishment. And it's so upside down. It's like a lot of the other kind of upside down things that we see um, in, in, in the book of God. When Jesus talks about the last shall be first, the first shall be last. You know, if, if you think yourself great, you will actually be last. There are so many things that I think naturally we think one way, but God is showing us, no, it's actually the opposite way. And it's actually, I desire something better for you um, than, than what you have thought is best for yourself. And you could go on and on about <clears throat> all the different, in the Old and the New Testament, examples of, of things like that. But it's interesting uh, to look at it through, through that lens. Okay. All right, so um, next we'll look at Romans uh, we'll, we're still in chapter 1, and I got a little ahead of myself. I knew you guys would not be as talkative as the back classroom. Um, I'm going to try to change that. Um, Jake, would you mind reading verses 28 through 32, please? Yeah, sorry. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it doesn't just have to be that. I mean, anytime we deviate from God's plan, be it for the family or for natural relationships, there are always things that we didn't anticipate, that we didn't count on, that we didn't expect, that it reminds me of um, when Paul was on the road to Damascus and, and Jesus says, it's hard for you to kick against the goads. And I think, uh, I think in the... King James, it says, it's hard for you to kick against the pricks, which were these long wooden prods that they would use to, to, to get the cattle to move ahead, to move forward. And Paul, killing Christians, was, was that ox trying to kick against that thing. But he, that ox in that situation cannot get away, right? It can kick and kick and kick, but it just does itself harm. And in the very same sense, that's what Paul was doing until, until he was um, changed and made an apostle. And that's what we do today when we go against, even in a small way. And I believe that there are consequences that, that, that grow and shrink in accordance with the degree of our offense. Um, but even in small ways, that same thing happens. And so, yeah, thanks for that comment. I'll try to look up more. Anybody else? All right, Jake. Okay, so if you, if you have a healthy fear of your Creator, there are portions of this um, passage that, that should scare you a little bit um, because it shows us the, the danger of, of deviation and it shows us the danger of getting, getting off course and, and off track. Um, and so if you think about like verse 28 again, even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, okay, so... They didn't even like to have God in their mind. They didn't like to think about God. They didn't like to incorporate God into their decisions or into their thinking. Even as much as they did not like to have God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a debased mind. That means God is removing their powers of wisdom, of righteous judgment, of judgment for good things, of their ability to make the right decisions for themselves, for their loved ones, for their families. God leaves them 
with that. And, and that, to me, that idea that God has that ability to weigh the thoughts or the judgments of your mind, he can take away those blessings or provide those blessings at any time the closer we are to him, that is pretty profound if you think about it. Because you don't really feel that as you, as you make choices and as you're trying to live a godly life. But here we have it right here in Romans chapter 1, verse 28, of God removing their reason when they left him, right? And not only giving them over to a debased mind, that means a mind which is corrupt, more, more likely to, to seek the self, more likely to seek sin, more likely to seek um, empty things, but to do those things which are not fitting, being filled with all unrighteousness. So it just is a downward spiral of once you leave God and you do not want to consider God and make him part of your life or part of your thoughts or part of your, part of your decision-making processes, God kind of lets you do your thing, right? And th the thinking behind that, at least the end of that, is that each one of us has a limit where we will experience consequences to the degree where we say, okay, I've had enough. Uh, it's obvious that this was a bad idea to leave the Lord, and I'm ready to come back now. And you'll see that happen in people's lives, and I think you see that happen in, in, in our own lives to certain degrees. Um, we'll kind of come back and forth sometimes. But it's scary to think that you could not have that internal gauge and that you could just be lost forever. Um, in that sense. But this is the description of, of what happens to these folks. So, um, thinking about that condition, though, oh, yeah, John. Yeah. Yeah, that's awful, right? That phrase, diluting influence, that's scary. That's a, an, an influence that's strong, that's going to persuade your thinking, but it's confusing. And you might think you're, but you're not. But then and at, the, at the end, you're going towards wickedness, right? Yes. That's like trying to get water. Yeah, that's a great point. It's not like trying to get water out of an empty well. Like you're going, you're going through the motions, but that, that, that worship, that interface with your creator isn't really happening. There's that fish, John, that fish that changes genders. Don't you know about There's your proof, right? That's all you need to know. <laughs> I did it for you. I'll look foolish for you. Right. Um, it's, it's really ridiculous. And, and you, I'm not going to say you stole my thunder, but that's kind of the cherry on the, the cake or the ice cream or whatever, is um, it's that not only do those same things, but they approve of them. So here we have that upside down um, idea that I was kind of playing with earlier, where you're looking at what's right is wrong, what's wrong is right, and things that are inherently unrighteous, un unvirtuous, um, blatantly sinful are held up as values. And that is, in, the, in, in, this, sen in this sense, that's the consequence. That's what results. From, from leaving God and from, from denying God. Yeah. 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 Mm-hmm. 
Yeah, I mean, it's so it's like spiritually, um, I guess you could say like cosmically, like nothing's really changed. It's the same thing. We're just, they, every, they, they look different, they're shaped different, but it's the same thing at its core. That's a great point. Um, it's been the same ever since. Yes. Yes. And I think if you if you live long enough, if you you know if your life experience is wide enough, you'll hear about or you'll know somebody, and you're like, "What happened? I can't believe that happened." And it's not that necessarily that that's exactly what we're talking about, but that's a great example, Bethany. Of you're right, the riches and mercy and grace they're so they're so plentiful, and our cup runneth over, right? And sometimes our hearts are so full. Well, you look at the other side of that, just the thought of maybe I don't need God for this decision can lead to a life where it talks about they are filled with unrighteousness, sexual immorality, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, envy, murder, murder, uh, strife, deceit, and evil-mindedness. So none of these characteristics obviously serve to fill the mind, heart, and the soul with joy and happiness. But God's creation, we're, we're meant to glorify God in righteousness. But instead, that's transformed through our arrogance um, into us being whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, violent, proud, boasters, Inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, undiscerning, untrustworthy, unloving, unforgiving, unmerciful. I think disobedient to parents is um, really telling that that's in there. I don't know that you can necessarily attribute a lot of these awful things uh, to a child, but that a disobedient to parents idea kind of speaks to you know God's the idea of God's family unit kind of breaking down, right? And whenever, whenever we leave that, that faithful design, um, you know, it's the, 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 this is part of the, the punishment. So, you know, sadly, um, do I say something? No. These concepts are all too apparent in the society that we live in today. Um, homosexuality, which was once publicly abhorrent, is now spread far and wide. Um, the values of humility and honoring parents are, are difficult to find. Like humility, um, that's, that's a virtue that on the public stage is, is not really valued anymore. But, you know, I always try to, I think about something Scott Foster said one time. Um, if we think it's really bad, and if he said this in his class, I'm sorry, I'm just repeating what he said, so it might be old news to you guys, but if we think it's really bad, the society we're living in now, what do you think it was like, you know, living in Rome around this time, right? It's probably a lot worse for believers like us then than it is now. So don't get me wrong. I'm not saying things are awful. Um, they can be much, much, much worse. And we still are very blessed to live where we live. So in verse 32, I've got one more question uh, before we conclude for tonight. Verse 32 says, "Who Knowing the righteous judgment of God, that those who practice such things are deserving of death. Why does Paul conclude that these people are deserving of death? What do you think about that? Why does he say these people deserve to die that have left God? Yeah, the wages of sin is death. Um, I think there's more than one right answer for this. My personal take is, yes. Mm -hmm. Mm 
Mm -hmm. That's a great point. Yeah, I hadn't even thought of that point. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. And he's just reminding them of that. Yeah. Um, I like that take. Um, I, I, to, for me, I, I think I took more of a pragmatic stance that it's like if, if we are God's creation meant to glorify him, and if we choose not to, then we have no real use to God anymore. Right? Then our life really is truly futile. And so um, I'll leave you with that happy thought um, as we end the class tonight. So please read Romans 2 uh, for next Wednesday. Thank you for your attention and for your uh, kind remarks.